we go. Starting recording again. Very important to hit the start button. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So this first lecture here is designed to reacquaint you with quantitative data if it's been a while and also to introduce you to the terminology that I'm going to use to describe variables this semester. So most of this should be familiar with the exception of how to get this information from software. And in this lecture I have included examples of how I got computations using SAS, Stata, and R, so the code and the results. I don't have a separate handout that's just code and results like I normally would because I'm going to be making videos instead. I have not had a chance to do that yet, but they are coming. So um, this is just one unit in one lecture for all of this. So away we go. So in describing types of variables, not just in terms of their role in the model, independent versus dependent, which is something that's not quite relevant for us yet, but just what, how is it measured? How do you think about it? And there's one big difference that you have to keep in mind in thinking about how to describe a variable and whether that it's categorical is one family or quantitative is the other. Basically, the question boils down to, is this really a number or is this a label that a number is representing? That's what you have to ask yourself. And which kind it is then logically dictates, so this is the if this then that portion, how you would summarize the variable, what salient features you'd want to keep track of, and how it would be used in a subsequent analysis. So the terminology that I'm using is related to what you would have seen in other courses as levels of measurement, but with the twist in thinking about how I would approach modeling them at the same time. So once we have that terminology introduced, then we'll talk about how you would summarize different kinds of variables. In other words, generating univariate descriptive statistics. So univariate is a word that means one variable at a time, as opposed to bivariate, which would mean two, or trivariate, which would mean three, or multivariate. Uh, there's not a four variate, as far as I know. Quadvariate? Well, I'm not even sure what that would be, but it's not a thing, as far as I know. Descriptive, that word means I'm not trying to say anything, right? I'm not trying to make any kind of inference about whether this is important or different or special. I'm just telling you what it is. This is the mean, the end, right? That's descriptive. This is the kind of information that you would report in a method section in a manuscript describing the data that you have collected descriptively. And then the term statistics, which as we've discussed is scary, but what it means in this context is just these are characteristics of the data that we have, the sample that we have, as opposed to the true answers from the population that we will never know because population is a hypothetical construct. So on paper here, it looks like we're going over things that you probably already know, but my secret purpose to doing this besides just mapping words and ideas is to give you practice doing things you know how to do in a new way of doing it, so using the software. So I'll tell you right now, your first real homework, which is not due for a few weeks yet, is going to be generating information you'd put in the methods section using SAS, Data, or R. Because I'm guessing most of you know what a mean is, right? <laughs> that one for sure. And you probably know a lot of these other ones too. But what you may not know how to do yet is how to get that information out of these packages. So rather than trying to introduce new software and new ideas at the same time, we're going to go with old ideas with new software. All right, so categorical variables is one major kind of the two. And the key point is that even if the data are stored using numbers, the numbers aren't really numbers. They're labels. So a binary variable, for instance, is the name for a variable that has two possibilities. A synonym for that is dichotomous. So dead or alive, pregnant or not, um, positive or negative for COVID. That's a fun one. We all want to make sure that we don't see that line pop up on the little test, right? It's, it's either or. Nominal is another category. 
and that is used to describe a variable that has three or more possibilities, but the possibilities are unordered. So if I asked you what's your favorite type of pet, of course, cat is the correct answer to me. And some of you are thinking, what? It's dog, clearly. And if you had to rank order what your favorite pets were from a list, we'd all come up with different orderings, right? There's, there's not an order to it. They're just different kinds. Uh, which program you're from, that's a nominal variable. Um, your racial or gender identities are nominal variables. Uh, there's lots of those types of things. And you may store your information in a data set where one is this and two is this and three is this because it's easier to type one, two, three as you're answering something. But the use of a, a number is just a representation. It's not a real number. Ordinal means that it's still kinds. The numbers are still just labels, but there is an order to it that everyone would agree to. So uh, Likert scales, for instance, this, this type of response, um, how much do you like being on Zoom for class, right? I really don't like it. I don't like it. It's okay. I like it, right? Those sorts of questions. That is an ordinal variable. And when you enter the data, you might enter one, two, three, four, but a mapping of one equals strongly disagree, 20 equals disagree, 300 equals agree is equally valid because these aren't numbers. They're ordered, but they're not really amounts in the same way that temperature is a number. It is three degrees. We've hit positive. Woohoo! So synonyms for this overarching category that you may have heard from other folks. A categorical variable is also known as a discrete variable. A qualitative variable, which is a terrible word because it has nothing to do with qualitative methods, which is a whole nother set of things that I know nothing about. A grouping variable. A factor variable is what it's called in R. It's called a class variable in SAS. So all of those are synonyms to me. The general idea is that these types of variables may use numbers to store them, but they're not really numbers. Hey, I have a quick question about that too. Please. So with the synonyms, would you just recommend that we learn categorical variables if this is what we're learning and then all of those are kind of just there on the slide and we refer back to them if we need to? This is for or, when you're talking to someone who isn't me. And if okay. they, they ask what kind of grouping variables you have in your analysis, you'll be like, oh, what's that? Oh, oh, they mean categorical. Okay. 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 So it's more for like a receptive type of vocabulary. Yep. And we can use the yep. categorical. Okay. I'm going to try to use the term categorical consistently, but I will occasionally slip up and say group variable instead. So this is also to uh, hedge that off. H head that off? Yeah, hedge my bets and head that off. That's that's where I was going. I was putting those together. So yes, other people will use different terms. Um, for instance, if you're looking at the documentation in R and something mentions something being a factor variable, know that this is what they're talking about, that kind of variable where it's not really a number. Okay. The other kind, major two kinds, quantitative where the numbers are actually numbers. So this implies interval measurement, where the distances between the numbers mean something, and they're equal in magnitude. Unfortunately, for the purposes of predicting these things, a lot of quantitative variables have one or more natural boundaries that make it uh, require a more complex model. So for instance, binomial variables. These are variables that have two boundaries because there is a low end that is fixed and a high end that is fixed. So the number correct on a test, the worst you can do is zero. The best you can do is all of them. So if I correct for differences in the numbers of questions answered by going with percent correct or something like that, that's still kind of a binomial because I haven't changed the fact that the worst I can do is 0% and the best I can do is 100%. So it turns out that predicting those kinds of variables is tricky because you have to make the model understand 
that no matter how high up you go on some predictor variable, you can't go past 100%, and no matter how low you go on some predictor variable, you can't go past 0%. So even though these are quantitative, they tend to be tricky when treated as outcome variables in a model. That's what the class before this is going to do, um, these types of variables as one of the kinds. Count variables is another type that has boundaries, but in this case there's only one. So for instance, number of cigarettes smoked in a day. The lowest number you can have is zero. I, don't, I didn't smoke any cigarettes today, or I don't smoke. Um, how many cigarettes can you smoke in a day? A lot. I don't know what the upper end is, but there isn't one. So positive infinity, essentially. And count variables are also not truly continuous because they can only be whole numbers. So number of days where something happened to you, um, number of instances of this, that ki those kinds of variables are counts. And again, they are tricky to predict as outcomes because you have to make the model understand it can't go past zero. And just as an FYI, terms that you may also hear, if you have a variable where the lowest possible value is one instead, that is called zero truncated. And if you have a variable that has more zeros than you would expect based on um, that type of sample or population, it's called zero inflated. So those are terms that go with count variables that are special. So these are numeric variables. We can work with them just fine as predictors, as explainers. They are trickier to, to predict correctly as outcomes without switching to a different kind of model than what we will use in this class. Okay, with me so far. And then we get to quantitative variables that are actually continuous. And so in this case, we would have no boundaries. It could be any number, positive or negative, and it could be any number in between, so not just whole numbers. This is pretty rare in the social sciences. This is the type of variable that the models that we're going to learn, general linear models, are designed to predict. So why are you, you might be thinking, if it's really rare, then why are we going to learn to predict them? Well, in practice, a lot of variables tend to be continuous enough for these models to still work reasonably well. So there's a middle ground, a word that I use. So this is me making shit up. This is not something you're going to find in your textbook. Continue-ish. Those are variables that are, they're supposed to be continuous, but they're not really, but we sort of pretend they are so that we can work with them using models for continuous variables that are easier than models for non-continuous variables that are harder. So examples. If I asked you one question and I gave you four categories as a response, like strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, we would be like, yeah, that's ordinal, definitely. If I asked you 10 questions like that, and I summed the result of those questions and called that a score, you would be very tempted to be like, that's continuous. That's a number, right? It's a test score. And indeed, there's all sorts of classes about measurement and how to work with test scores and whether or not the items are measuring the same thing as a testable hypothesis. That's uh, structural equation modeling and item response theory models. But really, there's no difference between one item and 10 items. It's just that in practice, there's enough different values that people really want to treat it like a number, and they do. So there's a term for that, ordinal treated as interval. That is an actual term that people use. So we will predict variables that are ordinal treated as interval because they're continue-ish enough to be able to work reasonably well with the models. If you take a mean instead of a sum, which is better if some of the items might be missing, same thing, just changes the scale that you're working on, but it's the same idea. There's other variables that are more continuous, us, us, continuous, there we go, but are likely continue-ish depending on how well you're able to measure them. So things like heart rate, response time. Uh-oh, I'm frozen. going to stop talking until everybody's unfrozen. Oh, somebody moved. You're good on my screen. You're all frozen to me. Am I frozen? No, you're not frozen. I'm not frozen. Okay, you guys are frozen. <laughs> 
I'm waiting for the dreaded Zoom uh, low bandwidth or low internet resources message. Okay. So everyone is like mid smile on my screen. All right. I'm good to keep going. We can hear you, um, Lisa. You can hear but me. But I think you're frozen. But I'm frozen. <laughs> okay. I, I shudder to think what I look like right now. But as long as you can hear me, that is the important thing. So uh, continue-ish things, heart rate, response time, that depends on how the level of precision with which you're able to measure it. So they're going to be more continuous, but potentially still bounded in that like you can't have a response time that's lower than zero, for instance. And the same is true of test scores from measurement models. Those are going to have boundaries, but enough intermediate values that you can probably think of it as continuous. All right, I'm going to shut off my video for a second and see if that helps. I wonder if my computer is trying to update itself. That sometimes happens and kills my system resources. All right, did that make it any better? Lisa, if it makes you feel any better, everybody is either gone on my screen mm -hmm. or frozen, so. Yep, I have, uh, everybody's either, I can't see their cameras or they're off. And I think it's a combination because there's some people who don't have their names, which I mean, I, their camera is actually on. It's just that my system can't deliver it through the connection. No one is frozen. Looks fine over here. Okay, pr apparently the problem is on my end and potentially other folks. We will uh, we will get through it. All right, last one is ratio. So that one is where you have a true zero point and you can actually say things like, it's twice as cold today as it was yesterday and, and it actually has meaning in terms of the distances between the two. Ratio scaling is pretty rare we can just fold those into the category of continuous variables without boundaries. All right, so questions so far? Start my video again and see if that helps. No questions? I can still see the chat window. So even if you're frozen, you should be able to communicate that way. So moving back to what we do with this information then, what kind of variable you have if it's categorical will always matter. What you can then do with it depends on whether it is binary, ordinal, or nominal. Distinctions among quantitative variables matter a lot more if they are to be outcomes, things that are predicted as dependent variables rather than predictors or independent variables. How to know which is which depends on your question. So that is something that would be up to you in a given data set. A lot of times it's straightforward, but not necessarily always. So how do you talk about categorical variables first? This is the easy one. All you got to know is how many people are in each category. That's it. So we would get the frequency of each category. It's easier to express a frequency as a proportion. So if you take the frequency of each category, divide by the total across all the categories, that's a proportion. If you multiply that number by 100, that becomes a percentage. That's it. You don't have to worry about anything else. That's all you need to know is, to, is what percent were in each category. You report that, you move on. And if you want to make a picture to illustrate that, I would do that with what's known as either a bar graph, bar chart, bar plot. All of those things mean the same thing. And adding value labels to the variable in your data set is going to help you convey that information more readily. Meaning, don't show one, two, three, four, show the words that one, two, three, four represent. For instance, welcome to SAS and Stata. So SAS is on the top. If I wanted to find out how many people I have in each category of a, a categorical predictor, whether it's binary, ordinal, or nominal, I would do the same thing. 
In SAS, the command that I would use is proc freak. Can you guess what freak stands for? Is it frequency? Yeah, frequencies. It can't be freaky because that would be spelled differently. And as best I know, there's no proc freaky. SAS wants you to tell it what data set you're asking about. So the data equals option here is where you would tell it which data set you're using. Table it means which variables do you want to summarize? What is the name of the column that contains the information you'd like me to do frequencies for? In this example, we have a variable called marital, and there's five possible categories, as we can see from the results. The slash here indicates options. So if you want to ask for things to be shown or not shown, for instance, Keyword missing means if anybody is missing on this variable, go ahead and put them in the table too, so I'll know about it. And in SAS, you would highlight these words, hit the run icon on the software or the keyboard shortcut, which is F3, and out pops this table. Ta-da! It's HTML output. It's very uh, lovely. If you're not a fan of the blue, you can actually customize that to different colors if you want to. I've never gone to the trouble, but one can. And in SAS, you get both frequency and percent automatically. And I will note that these are percentages, not proportions. So I have a note down here for homework one, you'll need to convert this percent to a proportion. So if I ask you what proportion of respondents are married, the right answer is 0.45, not 45. It's the same information, but on a different scale. Cumulative frequencies and percentages are also given. Notably, the cumulative column right here, the 734 in the last one, that tells you how many people are in your data set. How can we include a missing value if it's missing? Can I explain? Yes. If my sample had any missing values on this variable, I would have a sixth category down here that would be labeled missing. And it would tell me how many people did not give me a one, two, three, four, or five. Sure, good question. Because that's something you want to know about. Right, Because if I'm going to say 45% of my sample is married, but half the people didn't answer the question, 45% <laughs> of my sample is not married. 45% of the people who answered the question are married. And that's a different thing. So this is what it would look like in SAS. In Stata, it's three words. Stata is all about saving you typing. So the command is tabulate, which sounds like table, so that works. The variable that you want to tabulate is called marital. Comma is used to separate options, and missing is the keyword to do the exact same thing. Stata output is ugly. It's just plain text. And I'm sure there is a way to make it prettier if you go to the effort to do so, but this is what gets spit out. It looks like this. So it has the same labels, it has frequencies, it has percents, and then it has cumulative percents. Oh, I forgot to update the total. This should say 734 down here. I think this is a copy-paste error from a different example. So I will fix that after class, but you can cross that out and put 734. I had a question. Please. Um, so the, the missing means people who've responded and who've not responded, this table includes all of them. It would, and this data set is complete. So, uh, I mean, is there a way to know how many, I don't know if I missed this, but yep. how many are missing? It would tell you in another row in each of these tables. Um, it's a row in SAS, it might be a note in Stata, but on the output, it would tell you how many cases do not have a value for this variable. Okay. 
So if you if you visually scroll through the data set, you will just see blank spots or like a dot that's holding the place and it will tell you how many dots you have instead of answers. Okay, thank you. And we don't know how many people have so the frequency is the number of people who've responded to this. In in this case because there's no row for missing, I know that there's 734 people in the data set. Got it. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in your homeworks, all of your data will be complete. You won't have any missing data because that's a complication that you can learn to fight with later. <laughs> but in your lives, you will have missing data because people do not always cooperate. So I want you to give you the tools to, to figure out how much missingness you have. Uh, question. Question. What would, I have what a question. What happen if someone put Ooh. like 4.5 versus 4? Ah, so data entry errors. We would have a, a row here that is 4.5, and it would probably just say 4.5 <laughs> if I didn't have a word that I told the program to use as to what it meant. So this is a way to check to make sure that you have only the choices that you're supposed to have and that there's no data entry errors. By the way, you, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, please go no, ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say if these are numbers and it's one, two, three, four, five, right? And if you allow somebody to write um, not sure or something like that as words, then the numbers will be stored as text and it won't understand that they're numbers because text anywhere in the column will make the entire variable flip over to what is known as a string, which is a text variable instead. And that causes all sorts of issues. Okay, uh, question, please. Um, so you want us to put missing in there just to practice with the missing still for this class. We just know that there's never going to be a category for missing. Yes. I think okay. that, so what I expect you to do would be copy this, uh, <laughs> change oh, yeah. the name of your data set, change the name of your variable. Okay. Yep. And you can leave all the other options the same unless I uh, tell you explicitly otherwise. And then you're going to example one because it's literally the only example. Yeah, that, that's the name of the data set that I'm using to do this analysis is called example one. Okay. Yep. And the work thing is a SAS convention. Um, I was going to describe that in the videos because there's a visual that goes with where it is. SAS data set names have two parts, where it is and what it's called. And different places can be given different names. So work is a default location that you always have. It's like opens with SAS. It's a temporary directory. So what you'll do is import your data from an Excel format into a SAS data set. You'll work with it in this temporary directory because you don't actually need to save it as a SAS data set if you have all of the code you wrote. All you need is the original data and your instructions and you're good to go. Stata only allows you to work with one data set at a time. So there's no need in what you write to refer to which it is. It's the one that's open. <laughs> That's that's it. Great questions. Other questions while we're on the topic? You ready for R? Okay, it's table. So everything is a function in R. Table is the name of the function. So what do I want? I want a table. How do I make the table? Well, X equals example one dollar sign marital labeled. <laughs> that means use the data set called example one. Within that data set, use the variable that is named marital labeled. Now, why is that a different name than the other programs? Because R wouldn't let me add value labels in the same way, so I had to trick it. I had to convert it to a string variable that just had the words to make it look the same. The analog to include missing values, if there are any, is use NA equals if any. <laughs> NA means missing data in R terms. Not, not observed is really what it, not applicable is a terrible abbreviation for that, but not there. It should be NT, but it's not. 
So this is a good example of what I mean by R having a steeper learning curve. Like you'd look at this and be like, what? Whereas if you look at the other programs, missing. Okay, I can guess what that's talking about. I have less of a guess as to what the hell this is, but I found it on an example and it worked. So I, that's why I have it. So the output looks old school, just like it does in Stata, it's text. It gets dumped to a window. And this tells me the same information though in terms of the frequencies of each of these categories that we had in the first column of each of the other programs. And when I saw this, I was like, well, where's the proportions? Why doesn't it tell me that? Oh no, that's a separate function. And it's a function inside a function that I had to use to do it. So prop.table is another function that provides proportions. Proportions of what? The frequencies that I just found. So if you look at the parentheses, the embedded part of the, par the parentheses here matches what's up here. And then there's another set of parentheses around it to feed it into this. And then the end result is the same proportions that go with the percentages that show up in the other program. And I probably could have done this a third time to take the proportions and multiply them by 100, but I was like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> so these are proportions in the form that they need to be for your homework. And how to actually get it to spit this information out, I will show you in the videos. This is just sort of a quick introduction to what these things would look like. Think, yeah, pictures are next. All right, questions before we move on? All right, pictures. So here's the thing, folks. If I ever see a table like this in a job talk, that is not how we convey information quickly, right? If I want to tell a story that most of my sample was married, followed by second case was never married, I put this up instead. So this is what's known as a bar chart, bar plot, bar graph, whatever you want to call it, where the either percentage or frequency is the y-axis, and there is a separate bar for each possible category. Now one thing to keep in mind in these plots is that the ordering is based on how it's set up in the data set. So one is first, two is second, three, and so forth. But these aren't numbers, right? It's not like never is the most and married is the least. These are nom This is a nominal variable. This is what it looks like in SAS. If you want to add further customization, um, change the colors, add other labels or things. You can use a command that's proc gplot instead, but this is just a bare bones plot that you get from adding this option right here. So this picture was spit out in addition to this little table by adding plots equals freak plot type equals bar scale equals percent. On your homework, you will never be asked to make a plot of any kind. In your life, you should know how to make plots. <laughs> so that's why I'm teaching you. There's a distinction. So this is what it looks like in SAS. This is what it looks like in Stata. And I don't know what computer engineer thought baby puke yellow was a good default color for this, but they are mistaken. If you do not want to show your plot in baby puke yellow, there is a little window that pops up with this plot. Double click in the window, and then a whole set of options come for changing what it looks like. You can add your labels, you can change the colors, you can space the bars for a part, you can do whatever you want. I have not found code to do that though, which is problematic if you need to redo your picture because you're not able to quickly replicate what you did to make the picture the way it looked the way you wanted it to. There may be a way that I'm not privy to, but I'm not an expert in Stata the way I am in SAS. So Stata 
uh, you have to do a separate command to make a picture. The command is histogram. The variable is marital. Comma separates the options. I want it to be for a discrete variable, meaning that there's only whole numbers. I want it in percent. And XLA stands for X axis somehow. It goes from one, the last category is five, and I want it to use the words in the picture, not just the numbers. R looks like this. R's default is gray. And this is a very bare bones plot. One of the things that people like most about R is that it supposedly makes excellent plots. I say supposedly because I have never taken the time to figure them out. I know that they take a lot more code but that if you really need a great looking plot, R it allows you the utmost control of what it would eventually look like. So you can do some really cool stuff. So I found a command called bar plot that does what it's supposed to. The information that I'm feeding it though is the frequency table that I had before. So it's taking the table output and using that to make the plot as opposed to the other programs that are taking the original variable without that intermediate step. So I added the labels for the y-axis that I wanted it to be frequency and that I wanted the x-axis to be marital status. And so to make the percentage version then, after much trial and error, I found a way to trick it. So I have height equals prop table instead of table, so I'm switching it to proportions, and then times 100 to get to, pre to percentages. And then I add the labels, and that's what made this plot right here. So R is different. It's functions within functions because everything is object-oriented, and it's just a different way of thinking about how to do things. It has more flexibility, but it, it can be more onerous to figure out. It's less transparent. Okay. Now what about quantitative variables? I could use the same commands to make tables and plots of a quantitative variable. For instance, I have a variable that is annual income in thousands of dollars in this data set, and I ran proc freak to make this table. So one thing that jumps out at me immediately is that this is not really a continuous variable. These data that I'm playing with are from the general social survey from 2012. They came with the textbook that I have for a different class. And there, it is very unlikely that there are 19 people who made exactly $245 last year. So these are somehow rounded into bins that I was not privy to because when I downloaded the data, they look like this. So this is a great example of what I would call continue-ish. Like it's, it's numeric, I mean, these are dollars that, that I know the difference between $1 and $2 and $1,000, but they're not really continuous. But we'll pretend they are for the sake of analysis. So how much money do the, does our sample make? This is a terrible way to find that out. Because each unique value is listed, I don't have any kind of sense of how these values are spread apart and it's not helpful to summarize every single unique possibility if I have a whole bunch of unique possibilities and the numbers are actually meaningful. So I wouldn't do this on a normal basis. Likewise, I would not make a bar graph. Treating each unique value as a separate bar doesn't really tell me how much money do people tend to make. The highest frequency is 22,000, but I don't really have a sense of how far apart all of these categories are. So if you treat a quantitative variable like a categorical variable, that's not as useful. So we need to do something else. Instead, we're going to make a histogram, not a bar chart. Question. Uh, struggling to see the utility of the cumulative percent column, can you explain a little more? Ah, so there is no utility of it at all 
for a variable like this. I'm back to slide nine. Because marital categories are not ordered, they're nominal. And I could have had married be five, and I could have had divorced be one, and it would still be a valid variable. These are kinds. Now, what if instead I had a variable where it was something like, um, how many hours are you going to spend studying for this class? Zero, one to two, three to four, five to six. And then I had a cumulative percentage. And then I could say something like, 90% of my class thinks they're going to study four hours or less. If it's an ordinal variable, then having some kind of ordering and a summary of how much you have up to that point is useful. If it's a variable like this, it's not useful. Good, I'm glad that makes sense. Uh, we're wrapping up here shortly. I am watching the time, I promise. But this actually illustrates a really great point about all of these software packages, not just SAS, not just R, including SPSS and everything else under the sun. They do what you tell them to. There is no catch to prevent you from doing things that don't make sense. It's just a computer. It does what it's told. So I have a slide on this later, but just to foreshadow, could I take this variable and ask SAS to spit out a mean? What's a mean marital status? Could I? Should I? Sure I could. The mean marital status is something like 2.4. I already looked this up. Does that number mean anything? Nope. So as much as it's nice to have the program do the math for you, the human <laughs> still has to tell the program to do something that means something. And that, my friends, is why I have a job. Until they can figure out a way to automate it to, to prevent people from doing things that don't make sense, you still got to have a little human factors in there. Uh, other question, for SAS, green letters mean notes, how about R? Yes, that is one thing that the programs have in common. Any text that is in green is a note to yourself that the program disregards. It's known as a comment, more generally. Um, I purposefully keep the colors whenever I show syntax to highlight what things are notes and what things are commands. In, let me see if I have an example of that. I think I have one somewhere. Yeah, yeah. So in Stata, for instance, to make a note to yourself, it's either a star or a slash slash like this. I use slash slash so that you know that it's Stata code when you're looking at it. In SAS, it's a star. And in R, it is a, let me find an uh, example of it. I don't have one in there, do I? Yes, I do. Here's R code. It's this thing. Depending on how old you are, this is either a hashtag or a pound sign. It's a pound sign to me. Hashtag R. So this is something you can do to help yourself down the road. If you go to the trouble to figure out how to do something, leave yourself a note about it. <laughs> Put it in your own words. This does this. This option was added for this reason because then when you come back to it a year from now, you'll be like, what is this? I knew this at some point. Oh, wait, here are my notes to myself. Thank goodness. So my microphone keeps falling down. It has lost its will to live, which is good since we're out of time. All right. Any other questions as we wrap up for today? I just have a couple of check-ins, um, yeah, yeah. Lisa. Uh, do, will you make um, this slide available on ICON? The slides are available on the course website. There's a PDF of them. Okay. And secondly, for R, when once we uh, um, let's see, Let once we import uh, the data, we do have to run it initially, right, before we can like do any function. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a whole set of steps that I am not showing in this lecture of how you import the data, how you label the variables in the way that you want them, and then how you do the stuff. And that is in the example syntax that I will show in the video. And just as an FYI, here's our course website. Here's the lecture slides. 
that I've been working through. There's a PDF right there. And then this folder has all of the data, program code, and output that built these examples. That's what I'm going to be walking through um, in the videos. And that is what you can use to do your first homework. So you can use those files, copy from them, change them, and then use it for your own purposes. Thank you. Good. Okay. Anything else? Okay, then we are out of time, except office hours are right after class. So if you want to hang out and ask more questions, that is fine. Otherwise, I hope to see you next week, hopefully in person. Hopefully, we will see. But if you want to stay on Zoom, that is perfectly fine with me. So that's it. Thank you for coming. Have a good weekend. See you later. Thank you.